So welcome, thank you everyone for coming out tonight um, to Science in the News' Fall Lecture Series. I'm Dana, this is Katie, we're the Science and the News co-directors along with our lecturers, Michael and Katie, and Chris, who's been helping them put stuff together. Um, so, I guess if on your way in, there are some handouts about the lecture, next lecture, and also a schedule for all the lectures that we have this semester. So, Maybe you grabbed one last week when you were here, but if you had a grab one already, go ahead and get our schedule so you can come to all of our exciting talks. We also have another flyer for another event series that we run called Science by the Pint, where we do a little bit less formal lecture style. We bring a whole lab to a bar, and you get to have a more one-on-one -on -one conversation with the scientists about their research. So we have both things we do, along with a bunch of other stuff. Feel free to go to our website or various social media accounts to learn more about that. Um, yeah, want to take over your house of work? Yeah, and I, I want to remind you all that everything we do is put together by graduate students for the general public. So um, your feedback is very important to us. And uh, that being said, let me just give you a quick overview of what's going to happen tonight. Uh, how many of you have been to a science community session before? How many of you? Okay, if this is your first time, welcome. Um, this is generally how it works. These speakers are going to speak, and you will hopefully listen. Um, and uh, the talk is going to be divided into a couple parts. There will be a 10 minute intermission in between, and there will be dedicated question breaks throughout the lecture, so please hold your questions until then. Dana and I will be here to moderate, um, and we'll also ask that our speakers repeat the question for our audiences on the live stream. Um, also, there are snacks, uh, handouts if you haven't had a chance to grab one. Um, and that's pretty much it. After the lecture, there will be a demo with this exciting seaweed that you see in front of the room. Um, so don't grab it quite yet, but live in suspense until your speaker is going to grab the magic seaweed. <laughs> All right, and without further ado, I'll let them get started. Okay. Thank you. Is there anybody at the screen turn on in front of your face? I don't know, I didn't do that. So I can give a shout, but I need to come to the camera. That made everyone small. I didn't even touch anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cool. Good evening. I'm Michael. I'm Nikki. So, what are you having for dinner? Well, we have new aquaponically sourced lettuce. We have cage fruit chicken and some local dairy ice cream. But I think the thing creates some more. Something comforting, like a hamburger and but fries. What are you just talking about your carbohydrate budget and the protein gap? Of you? That's a good idea. Okay, I'll go with the white rice. The brown. Okay, brown rice. The brown rice, I like broccoli. Oh, is that organic? Okay, okay, okay. okay. We'll go with the spinach. Spinach with brown rice, with possibly the top. Oh, what about the salmon? Oh, but I just watched this documentary and it said that you should know where your fish is sourced. I don't know where the salmon is sourced. Uh, is it genetically modified? I don't know if it doesn't bother me. It's environmentally better. It's genetically what modified. If, what if the fish escapes and goes into the wine patch and makes havoc on the ecosystem? Oh, that's a good point. And so I guess, but uh, if I'm just one person in seven billion, if we're trying to feed so many people, we should. Have you, have you thought about the mercury? Where does some stand? On the food chain. Okay, I think I'm just gonna have to say. Okay, okay, fine. Okay. And so, as you can see, uh, as soon as you begin to decide what goes on your dinner plate, um, past the psychological craving of what you want to eat first, the 
further and further you dig into what you put on your plate, the more and more complex this gets. Um, is this the fish or the protein source that you put on your plate meant to modify? What are the political implications of that? Does it bother you? Is what good for you? Good for the environment? Is it organic? What does that even mean? Um, where, is, where are these things sourced from? These are just some of the questions that come into play um, when choosing what to eat. And it's, nothing, it's not something that stands in one discipline. And so we're both uh, representatives of a brand new program at Harvard called the Master of Design Engineering Program. It's a collaboration between the engineering school and design school. I'm formally trained as an architect, but I've worked as an entrepreneur. Uh, I'm formally trained as an electrical and electronics engineer, but I also work as a theater and dance performer. So as you can see, some pretty eclectic individuals who have come together to tackle these complex problems, going across disciplines and breaking silos, and do some social good too, concentrating on social impact. And so this research for the last year is stemming from we did foundational research in agriculture, and we're now adopting that work for um, aquaculture and sea source protein, working in conjunction with the Harvard Office of Sustainability um, and Harvard Dining Services. There'll be three main parts. We'll go through defining sustainability and intricacies in defining what sustainable sustainability actually means. How you need to implement that definition through standards and certain measures. We'll then move into a supply chain analysis um, and what that means and walk through the implications for one species of fish. And from there, we'll go into a systems way of thinking. So different perspectives and different tools to understand, really begin to understand what are the implications of choosing a certain source of fish uh, and what you can do to be more sustainable. And so to begin, obviously we have a growing population, over seven and a half billion people in the world, and it's only expected to grow larger. And with more people, we're producing more food. And so this chart shows the amount of pounds per protein um, produced um, over the last 40 years or so. And as you can see, um, numbers are going up. And one of the most interesting things is um, farmed fish in particular, going from um, just one pound uh, before the 70s up to 17 pounds now. Um, and back in 2012 was the first point that we had more aquaculturally sourced fish than wild caught fish, right? And we've been really pushing ecological stocks on um, how much we can fish and source from the sea. And so uh, this chart here shows just production levels, and you can see in red the wild caught fish uh, caps off. We can only catch so much, and there's this growing trend of trying to grow fish. So, what does this mean? Uh, Wild caught fish is exactly as you'd imagine. Fishermen on a boat, technology, a net, or lines um, capturing fish, and aquaculturally sourced fish uh, are grown. You can think of the farmer planting a seed, but instead of um, a crop, you're growing fish. And within uh, America, North America, we can source about 22% of the fish that we consume locally. And so as you get into looking at where does all this fish come from, it's really, there's global implications where um, it's coming from all different parts. And uh, with the landmass um, water covering 70% of the planet, um, there are these, uh, again, uh, global implications of sourcing fish and understanding where they're coming from and uh, what it means. And this final chart um, is um, a, a look at um, GDP is on the horizontal axis, so it's gross domestic product, that's the total number of services and goods produced by a country, and on the vertical axis is the daily per capita protein supply, which is how much protein is available for populations. And as you can see, in the higher most um, part of the chart, uh, green is the United States, pretty high GDP, high protein rate, so there is this correlation as, as countries' economies begin to develop and there is more money available, there is a trend in consuming more protein, and so um, what gets really interesting is as um, emerging markets and developing countries begin um, developing, so India and China, where there's a larger population, a larger middle class, it is implications of where do we source more and more of our proteins, specifically fish. Um, one really interesting example from the last 10 years was Maine. Everyone knows Maine lobster. Um, we have too much of it, and we can't eat all of it. And so the last 10 years have been trying to expand um, its reach. In the last 10 years, um, China has gone from importing $100,000 in Maine lobster to over $27 million worth of Maine lobster. So just, um, that's just one anecdote. And so now we start talking about the definitions of sustainability, because before you embark on any research, uh, it's important to get the theory clear and important to define what your benchmark is. So we started looking at different stakeholders' version of sustainability, and 
a lot of them are widely different. So if you look at WWF, then they're defining sustainability around supporting ecosystems. If you look at the World Business Council, then they're defining sustainability around bottom lines. And if you look at uh, the policy institutes, then they're talking about vitality and resilience and communities. And even when you don't have different stakeholders just pushing their agendas through their definitions of sustainability, you have a generalized definition which basically loses any meaning because of ambiguity. So uh, all of these seems like uh, seem like uh, very vague responses to a situation in crisis. And so, is this a good place to start? Is this enough to just defining sustainability in a way that you can't build on top of it. And so we started looking at anecdotes that could actually help us build our own version of the definition so that we could start from there. <coughs> and uh, to see where we're coming from, uh, let's just listen to a story of God, which was defined, which defined the culture and the livelihood of a community along <coughs> the northeast coast of North America, and that is for 500 years until in 1992, the stocks just collapsed and the corn was gone. So let's just hear that story before we get into the definition. And to keep things straight, we're going to be talking about two species of fish tonight the Atlantic salmon, which made it on the dinner plate, which will go through the supply chain analysis and systems, and cod, which is more of a historical anecdote of keeping the grounds and the things and why they're important. And so for cod, we're going to go through a four, four part act uh, to hear a little bit about that. And so, Settling in America, you had a new population of new people who didn't know how to farm <coughs> themselves. The land wasn't that terrible, especially in New Finland. So you had a vast amount of richness uh, and resources in the ocean, and that was in the form of cod. Uh, cod used to be a couple of feet long, and uh, there was a saying that you could just put a basket in and you get a basket full of cod. And one thing that we don't really uh, intuitively associate with historical settling in North America is how embedded and integrated cod was um, for developing the country and uh, in this kind of triangle of trade where um, good cod made its way from New Finland to the coast of New England because New England had rocky coasts in which they could dry the cod. That was an important process because to, uh, to ship cod across the Atlantic back to um, Britain and Spain, um, you had to dry it and salt it. So it was, good cod was shipped down from New Finland, processed in uh, New England, also caught there. And from there, the good dried salted cod made its way back to um, Great Britain and Spain, and um, along with rum. And the low quality cod, stuff that wasn't going to be sold at a premium, actually made its way down to the West Indies. So um, again, you now have um, cod becoming a major, um, major export import for North America, uh, New England specifically, um, and integrated uh, with molasses from um, and slavery. So um, with the economic growth and the prosperity that Todd had brought going into the 19th century, um, this is a quote from Thomas Henry Huxley in the International Fisheries Exhibition in Britain. And the quote is, any tendency to overfishing will meet with its natural check in the diminution of supply. This check will always come into operation long before anything like permanent exhaustion has occurred. And so there was this idea that we can continue uh, to rely on this resource and fish and fish and fish um, because there's no way it could possibly run out. For 150 years, this quote really found its way um, into policy decisions around regulation. There was a lot of push from countries to begin to regulate these things because there was a notice noticeable difference of depletion in stock. But again, it was just unfathomable at the time that we would run out. And according to this quote, we would be able to notice if there was to be a problem. Going into the 20th century, um, different places around the world did begin to have some signs of a depleted stock. And Iceland, which has a historic uh, tradition of its industry providing for its country, uh, was one of the first to begin to regulate the shores of its land. So it started with uh, three miles off of the, the, the shoreline is protected and owned by Iceland. And there was this cod war between Britain and Iceland uh, because uh, fish and chips, you have to have to have some good cod for fish and chips. And so um, Britain kept going into um, what um, Icelandic people considered their waters, and so there became this push of, uh, no, we own this. And um, up into the middle of the 20th century, there was this idea that, like, what range off the coast of land can a sovereign nation own? And it wasn't until Harry Truman, post-World War II in America, sanctioned 
um, owning the oil pipeline um, for, for the United States. Um, that was the first time that a country had ever claimed uh, ownership of um, this resource on the continental shelf. If you could claim something on the continental shelf, you could claim something that's uh, fished and sourced right above that shelf of cod. So Iceland pushed for this 200 mile regulation off its shores. Britain pushed back, of course, and um, ultimately at the end of the 20th century, you had that passed into regulatory law that said anything off the shore within 200 miles is your own to be a source of fish. Going into the 21st century, um, you have even more imposing regulations. So within New England, we have unfortunately depleted our stock of cod. And so this is a portion, uh, this is a picture of a memorial in Gloucester for fishermen. And um, there are fishermen being displaced because what has been a family tradition or heritage for over 200 years is now no longer a viable um, option. Um, and so there's a really great documentary, Sacred Cod. It's a little sensationalized, but it brings down the question of what happens to this individual who just wants to be on the water and wants to fish and wants to continue this legacy and no longer uh, sustainably and economically provide for his family for something as simple as a holiday gifts. And so um, something that's come up um, post this depletion of cod is um, dogfish. Dogfish is a kind of shark. So um, in terms of ecological balance, there are more dogfish in New England. And it is a great source of protein and we should utilize it. But another thing to consider is dogfish is a shark. And so what cod can lay millions of eggs at a time. Dogfish, um, dogfish has puppies, and so instead of millions in terms of reproduction rate, it has tens. And so we, we went through and fish and ate all of the cod. Imagine how quickly we source the dogfish. So now we actually begin to make sense to these stories and other stories that we go through on how to start defining sustainability. And this was our attempt at the definition. So it is a quality of the system that allows it to self-sustain and regenerate because there are interdependencies within the system that connect across scales, firstly. So there are three scales. One is the macro scale, which is policy and regulatory institutions. Then you have the meso scale, the middle scale, where we're talking about uh, institutes uh, which have resources and uh, uh, which have some power and agency. So in this case, let's say the Gulf of uh, Maine Research Institute. And uh, at the micro level, you have the fishermen, you have the individuals, you have the families, you have the community. And apart from scales, uh, you should also look at interdependencies across dimensions. So you're looking at the social dimensions of human well-being, uh, community engagement, heritage, culture, and you're looking at the economic dimension of employment and access to markets and alternative livelihoods. And finally, of course, the environmental dimensions, ecosystem balance, uh, pollutants, industries, on a larger scale, the weather and climate. And apart from the, this basic definition, it's important to incorporate the idea of dynamism in the definition of sustainability, because if you're a 19th century uh, decision maker, and if you take the same model as the 19th century decision maker was looking at uh, the ocean and seeing there was an infinite supply of God, and then you're making the same decision today, then your model will just come out with the wrong results. So uh, dynamism is important. And finally, it's important to measure because you cannot manage what you cannot measure. So uh, this is kind of a condensed definition that uh, for the sake of uh, a pitch that we came up with that it's the quality of self feeling dynamically across scales and dimensions. And preferably, it should be measurable. And we, we were comfortable enough to start working off of this definition of sustainability. So talking about measurements and metrics and dimensions, uh, these are some of the standards that actually apply on seafood throughout the industry. And I think the density of the slide and how bad it is is a true proof of what I'm going to talk about, which is that there are too many standards right now. So um, let's say that you're a conscientious consumer and you want to make sure that you're making the uh, right food choices. So before going to, let's say, Whole Foods, you go to the Whole Foods FAQ and you start reading up on the sustainable, uh, seafood sustainability uh, FAQ page. So it starts with, why do we need sustainable seafood? Yeah, that's a question that you might have had. Then you go to, um, 
what makes whole foods seafood different from other seafood? Yeah, sure, you had that question. Then, does sustainable seafood taste any different? Yeah, what do I need to know about mercury in fish? Okay, and then as you keep on reading, things start getting a little complicated. So, for instance, how does a fishery become Marine Stewardship Council certified? How do we know that the standards are being met? How long does this certification last? Can farmed fish qualify for certification? And at this point, you just remember, oh yes, there are farmed fish and there's wild catch. And then, is farm raised seafood organic? And then you just think, oh yes, there are organic standards for food. So, why do we have organic standards for seafood? And then you look at this possible farm logo, and then you're looking at aquaculture, and finally, the entire complexity is unleashed upon you because then you have questions like, why hasn't World Foods Market developed its own standards for wild caught seafood? And why is some wild caught seafood listed as not yet created? And who are World Foods Market's partnering organizations, the Safina Center and the Monterey Bay Aquarium? And at this point, you're wondering, who are the consumers who are frequently asking these questions? And then you just go to color coding, and then it's about why aren't you using the color codings of Monterey Bay Aquarium over the Sabina Center? And why don't Marine Spiritual Council's product carry a color coding? And then the last one on the camera's back is why are green ground fisheries so important? And by this time, even though you wanted to make a really good choice, a really good decision, the standards have really gotten to you and you probably don't want to eat fish anymore. So it's not just that these standards are messy, they also don't match. And uh, this is a screenshot from a website called fishchoice.org, which is suppliers and vendors to understand what sort of decisions they're making. But only the seafood provided for the seafood product, that is Atlantic salmon. And if you see, there are a lot of places uh, when, especially let's say, if you're sourcing your Atlantic salmon from a marine net pen in Canada, then you're not sure because ocean rights say that it's not good to do that. But seafood watch is like, yeah, you can, you can go ahead and do that. So you're not making that decision. So I think it's a good place to just answer all the questions for a minute. What is the oldest standard? Um, the oldest standard, that's actually a good question. I'm not sure if between the Marine Structure Council and Seafood Watch. So Seafood Watch started making uh, more of their uh, recipe suggestions way before they made their standards and then they uh, collaborated with the stewardship concept but I don't know if they like separately developed it and then one took over from the other but uh, I can like look that up later I guess. When you go to some grocery shop to buy some fish how do you know the information of these different standards how do you know how good is this fish? So the question is uh, when you go to the grocery store how do you know um, what, what's the information behind the fish? And so if you look at the handouts um, we have for you, we, we did list um, two websites into that, Fishing Choice and Seafood Watch. And so um, the opposite question, what's the oldest standard? The newest standard is Marine Bay Aquarium. And so apps like that will help you source through um, simple information in terms of is it certified in this and to what respect and what dimension. So more information on the handout. Is the FDA involved at all in any of this? Uh, so the question is that is the FDA involved in the standards? So FDA has been we come that FDA has been trying to create a, a one size fits all organic standards for fisheries, but uh, it's taken enough time because there are too many stakeholders and too many concepts. But yeah, along with the USDA. How many markets are involved in this? I don't think I've ever seen a, a fish have any rating in any season. I don't think I've gone to any supermarket and ever seen any fish have any rating. It's just like a fish. <laughs> <laughs> I want one of those. <laughs> so the question was, how many, how many markets um, are actually involved in uh, sourcing the fish to the standards or how are the margins? So I think one obvious difference between even just meat, uh, uh, livestock meat, um, cattle, chicken, uh, pork, and fish is um, fish isn't always obviously stamped with these things because if they don't 
agree on the back end, and they're not agreeing on the front end, which makes its way to the label. Um, and so uh, uh, on these websites, too, they will map different partnering organizations, and you can look at local suppliers, which, which um, retail outlets um, are working with the certification points. Um, but it is something that is behind the scenes because they haven't fully resolved. Okay, so there's no US FDA stamp or there's nothing on there that says good fish, bad fish, good fish. Do you, do you have the color ranking or the MSC stamp or the ASC stamp or the ocean rights stamp? And that's where the question is coming from. I mean, meat really is done that way for that fish. So you have right. but okay, so oftentimes it's hard to come up with a perfect index, but composites become interesting. So would you recommend looking, creating your own index of these, or is that? Well, the question was uh, if that index or should it exist, and we do address it later on. But just to like answer that quickly, uh, no, I mean, the system is too complex, and we will map out the systems through the diagram. So to have a one, one size fits all index for the entire system uh, is not something that till now we think is a, is a good measure. One more question. So I just want to make it clear. So when you are um, ranking the fish, actually you are not ranking the fish, you are not ranking the products, you are ranking the suppliers, right? So the question was the ranking of the fish, you're not actually ranking the fish itself, or you're ranking the processing and things around the fish. Uh, and the answer is it, uh, different certifications consider different aspects. And so for fish, the most important thing is how quickly can you get the fish from where, when it was harvested or captured to the retailer. And so processing is a big issue, but there are other dimensions of the certification scheme to play, like size uh, and things like that, because as we go into the systems analysis, there um, are ways to get uh, apparently good fish, but inherently um, there could be some other things wrong. So they do different standards do consider different dimensions. So uh, supply chain was the first step in our research because supply chain is the easiest way to start mapping chronologically where your product is coming from. So in terms of the definition, uh, it's basically a network between a company and its suppliers to produce and distribute a specific product. And uh, it represents the steps it takes to get the product or service to the consumer. And there are uh, six main steps to a supply chain uh, analysis that is you look at the inputs you look at the production you look at the collection the preparation the distribution and sales so uh, we can analyze these steps uh, by looking at the plate that we saw at the starting of the presentation so uh, the first step is the sales and that basically represents the interface with the final consumer so it, you might be uh, someone who's shopping for your product of the supermarket or uh, you're going to a restaurant or you're basically a student who's going to the Harvard University Dining Systems Dining Hall and you're getting your fish from there. And before that stage is the distribution, which is basically uh, the access of different markets over different geographies. So, Distribution covers logistics, and you have the main lobster flying all the way to China, and how that is managed. Uh, the next step, uh, or the step before that, is preparation, which is basically the processing of your goods and the value addition to make it more marketable or diversified. Uh, before that comes the collection, which is you're consolidating your goods from various suppliers. In the case of fish, it's Undocking, your weighing, your sorting, and both the collection and the preparation steps uh, create a certain amount of waste which might be put to other users. So, at times, the fish waste is put into creation of fish oils or fish cosmetics or fish leather or fish glue. And the step before that is production, which is either you're getting your fish uh, from an aquaculture tank or it's wild capture. And the very first step is the inputs that go into the production. So it could be equipment or the technology or the information which tells you this is where you can find a good density of catch or it could be the feed or uh, just the research and innovation that tells you uh, what is a good technology to employ in which part of the sea or the ocean. So just looking at supply chain, uh, what does it help you with? Uh, 
it helps you understand the net value so that you know where you can maximize your profits or minimize your losses. Uh, it helps you uh, leverage the logistics that you have at your hand so that you can access a market which is greater than your local market. It helps you build a competitive infrastructure so that you can make sure that uh, you're, you're strategically positioned in your market. Uh, it can help you synchronize your supply with demand and it can help you measure your performance globally. So for instance, uh, if I am a 19th century decision maker uh, looking at my cord supply chain, then I would say from the perspective of understanding net value or leveraging and logistics, I'd be uh, considerate of the fact that yes, there is low quality cord that I'm producing and I could ship it to the state colonies and I could get molasses in return. And I could then ship the rum both internally within the continent and out to Europe. Or you could look at building a competitive infrastructure perspective of the supply chain and just say that uh, I could use the rocky coasts that I have here in New England and use that to dry and salt the fish. And or I could just start the biggest ice industry uh, that existed at that point in time to start trading the fish to newer lands. Or I could just look at the supply or, and I could look at the demand and say that there is infinite supply and as much as the demand, I'm just going to keep on sourcing it with the supply that I have. But what does the supply chain not consider and why we needed to move on from just a simplistic supply chain analysis, which is usually where most analysis, analysis ends, uh, to uh, a systems thinking kind of an analysis is it does not consider scale. So where is the supply coming from and how are you going to service all these demands? Does it look at the larger ecosystem? Not necessarily. Uh, does it look at the people dimension or the ethical dimension of things? So right now the regulations that are being made to uh, uh, curtail overfishing are directly being only applied to the fishermen at the end of the supply chain when necessarily they are not at fault for the decline in the fish stocks or there is no concept of internal integration across organizations so uh, there are unrelated industries to the fishing industries that also pollute the ocean and increase the mercury content but that is not really uh, addressed in a pure supply chain analysis. And finally, there's a question of transparency and visibility of standards and the human capital and talent management, which is related to the ethical perspectives and the people dimension. So, which made us think if there is another dimension which could add an air of complexity uh, to our analysis and we could make a more thorough and multifaceted decision. And that's how we came to systems thinking. And so um, using a supply chain analysis, again, as an individual stakeholder organization, you really only care about your supply. And it becomes kind of like um, the, the poem of the blind man feeling the elephant, right? The first one feels the trunk and goes, I know what this is, I know what I'm feeling, it's broken. Um, and the second one goes, no, it's actually sharp and pointy, it's a weapon, it's a spear, because he was feeling um, the tusk of the elephant. And the third one goes, no, you guys have it all wrong, it's actually a wall. Third blind man was feeling the body of the elephant, and so on and so forth. The leg, no, it's a tree. The tail, no, it's a snake. And so, in order to listen and see and hear the whole story, you do have to take a step back and look at it as a system. A system is defined as an interconnected set of elements that is coherently organized in a way that achieves something. And so, three things are really important there. One, there are components to the system, and they can be categorized. Two, they're not standalone components, but they're connected and there are relationships between them. That's something we need to understand. And three, these things aggregate for a specific purpose. And so in terms of modeling the system out, there are four general um, processes and steps. One, develop a concept model um, as you begin to establish certain parts of the system. Two, um, add quantitative specifications, uh, variables, um, and charts, and graphing these relations. Uh, three, validate the model, bring in real data, does what you mapped and how you mapped it actually, uh, does it mirror reality or did you get something wrong? 
then for implement the model. And in order to do these processes, there are multiple stakeholders and perspectives. And because no one person or one group or one stakeholder has the whole picture. So you do need to take this top-down generalist approach to really aggregate the different perspectives. And so for our research, we are focused on just developing the concept model because we do want to use it um, for different finding different leverage points for carbon dining services and for um, looking at women fish sourcing. And so for this first step, there are four general considerations as you develop the concept for a model. First is bounding the system. This is really important because the system, as it's trans-scalar, can get infinitely and infinitely and infinitely more complex and messy. So you can go into subsystems or you can go outwards and you pretty much can map everything all the time in the system. So the first, one of the most important things is bounding what you're interested in um, to determine what fits and what doesn't fit in your model. Second thing is categorizing the components, what are similar, what are not similar, and using that categorization to identify the relationship between these different elements of the system. And for uh, formally representing the concept model as a visualization, again, to better understand it. And so we're gonna walk through this process right now. <clears throat> to start, um, it's just as you can imagine, a lot of whiteboarding, uh, kind of a lot of research, a lot of background information, mind mapping, getting these things on a whiteboard, and, uh, really beginning to make sense of what you have. And so for our purpose, we are looking to develop um, a more sustainable fishing system. Um, we are bounding it with just this one example of sourcing Atlantic wildly caught Atlantic salmon within the US. And the categories that we came up with as we begin to map out the different things to consider are um, the economics behind the system, um, things that move socially, environmentally, regulatory, and technology. And so this is the final map. Just giving you an image of the roadmap because uh, we're going to break it apart, walk step by step, and see how we got here. And so to start off, the first component of the system is a stop. And a stop is anything that can be measured, seen, or felt. It's an accumulation of material over time, and you really can think of the measurement unit as, unit as you begin to think of a stop. And you can think of a stop as a bathtub. A bathtub is a vessel, and it's uh, empty volumetrically, and it holds water. So the two most important stops for us are the amount of fish available, that's the fish stop, and the amount of fishermen, um, which is just measured a number of people, and how they're interconnected. The interconnection between two stops is called a flow. A flow is just the transfer of material, um, and again, uh, these things are uh, mapped onto something uh, tangible. So you, you, as you create um, these lines, you do have to think what's the unit measure. So between the fish stocking fishermen, uh, we have a number of fish caught for every catch. That's how we would be measuring it. And the T represents a valve. So as your tub has a faucet and a drain, um, the T represents, just as you can imagine, um, something to control that rate, to either increase it or decrease it. And there are two different kinds of flows, a supporting flow and an opposing flow. The supporting flow um, reinforces the two stocks. So as one goes up, the other one goes up. An opposing flow, there's a, an opposite relationship. So as one goes up, the other one goes down. So with this relationship between fish stock and fishermen, the more fishermen you have, the, more, um, the less fish stock you have because the quicker they catch it. So it's an opposing flow. And it's important, again, to begin to understand what each flow means as you connect the lines because um, one flow quickly turns into multiple ones um, and you want to be able to trace it back to, again, where to intervene or what to do. And so from this, we have two stops, let's add another. In terms of changing the number of fishermen, let's add another stop. Um, other forms of employment, or possibly unemployment, right? We're kind of bounding these things together. The rate is number of people, and it's an opposing flow. The more opportunities you have for other forms of employment, the less fishermen you have. And so uh, now we're going to introduce another um, component of a system, a feedback loop. And these are actually one of the most important parts of a system because they tell you, they usually tell you the unintuitive things behind what's happening. And so a feedback loop is a system structure that causes an output from one node to eventually influence the input of that same node. And so for two loops that we have in the system on fishing stock are birth and death rates. It's just a natural process of life. And one of the most important things to know in that is the delayed break, which means there takes a certain amount of time for the fish to mature. Um, and that's just something to consider um, to replenish the fish stock. The birth rate, birth rate is a supporting flow because the higher the birth rate, uh, the more fish there are, and then death rate is an 
composing flow um, or feedback loops. And the final component within a system um, is information flow. And this is anything that's intangibly influencing the system. And so one of the first things that comes into this, this schematic at the beginning of the systems map is regulatory measures. As we talked about after seeing the depletion of stock, um, the government came in and introduced um, one, a license and a quota for fishermen. And so that limits the amount of fish. One, that limits the amount of fishermen who can um, be on the water at a time with their boats. And two, that also limits how much of a certain fish you can catch. So as you can see, the green arrow points to the ballot because that controls the flow rate from fish stock to fishermen. Um, another form of regulation, the regulatory means that the government has done is subsidize fishermen. And actually, in New England, the government isn't subsidizing fishermen or other um, forms of employment. But in Newfoundland and Canada, for the last 10 years, um, they have been providing subsidies for fishermen. I'm hoping that one day, as the cod stock uh, replenishes itself, the fishermen can go back to fishing. So fishermen <coughs> have a government subsidy to find another means of uh, employment, which again, is, is begins to influence whether or not the fisherman goes to another um, job or profession. And so building on this model of fish stock, <coughs> fishermen, and other jobs they could do, uh, we're introducing the market. So the market is where the consumer comes into play. And I understand it is a pretty big box, just boxing in the market. But the idea with this is the fishermen are fishing, uh, are fishing different kinds of fish to sell them. <coughs> and so uh, you have two different forms of flows from the fishermen. Um, selling, you're selling fish, and sometimes it can be an opposing vote, sometimes it can be um, supporting, and um, not really satisfactory, but it's a little bit complex there. If you have too much fish in the market, maybe prices fall down, or maybe um, people just aren't eating fish, and it is very finicky. Um, and then coming down from the market, the higher, the more amount of people who want to eat the fish, the more the fishermen. And one of the information flow that comes in at this point is um, consumption trends, right? Um, popular kind of notions of understanding consumption behind different fish, and that begins to influence the market um, buying back from fishermen. From the market, um, which also includes different investments in technology, um, from the market you have waste. And that waste actually finds its way back to the fishing stock. So the greater amount of waste, the more it could influence um, both the feedback loops for the fish. You could begin to disturb natural cycles of birth rate and death rate, but you also could just uh, be depleting stock from waste. And um, the waste also now can, connects back to the market. Um, the more waste you have, the more market opportunity there could be to capitalize on other industries' waste because they'd be willing to pay you to take it away. And so this is our complete mapping of the system. And um, we're going to take a break because that was a lot to digest between some patching and system map. But uh, we're going to now use this to kind of explain um, what to do and how to look at it after uh, a break. Any questions? As with agriculture and manufacturing, capital and technology played a huge role in terms of the number of fishermen for catch. How do you factor that into your so the question so was, the factory ships and things like that, where you need a lot fewer fishermen than real job people, because so much is now technology. You can look at the factory ships, same with agriculture, same with manufacturing. Yep. So the question was, how do you um, begin to look at um, factory utilization, manufacturing, and technology use such as ships um, as it relates to less fishermen because the catch is going up? And so in this model, um, one of the things between markets, again, it's not only just the fishermen selling the fish, but it's the fishermen investing in technology. So as the fishermen invest in technology, they're actually in a closing loop, which reduces the number of fishermen. And again, at the curve of the um, 18th and 19th century, because we depleted cod, there are actually some regulatory bodies that have brought back traditional means of fishing, because we got too good at just scraping the bottom of the ocean floor with trolleys. And so other forms of fishing are encouraged. Um, but they're seen between the fishermen and the market in the map. So can you go one slide? Uh, in the system mapping, the only two feedback loop is to look at the birth rate and the death rate of fish stock. And did you guys ever think about some other dimensions like the size of the fish or the quality, or let's say gender balance, like how many male or female fish, this kind of so the question is, uh, in terms of looking at the systems map, you have a fish stock with two feedback loops. Have you considered other dimensions or other loops that influence that? And so directly answer the question, birth and death rate does encompass different things around the natural species of the fish. And 
In terms of other feedback loops, um, going back to the boundary of the system, this is just wild caught fish. And so as we begin to extend the map past wild caught fish into aquaculture, um, aquaculturally sourced fish, we actually would have a loop um, with pleading stocks, um, but we haven't gotten there. Yeah, and also uh, to add to that, uh, a lot of these subsystem boxes are black boxes, so we had to uh, cut down for the sake of uh, analysis a lot of loops that were going within these boxes. So the fish stocks could be, I mean, market itself has a lot of internal loops that are happening, but for the sake of looking at the fish stock, fish and other sort of analysis to begin with, we had to like uh, really purge in, in that sense. So along with expanding the boundary, it's also going into some of the most important subsystems, which again, now we have to begin engaging other stakeholders because we <laughs> researchers don't have the right to say any one of these is more important, we have to begin to look at other stakeholders. So things like mercury and stuff like that are going to fit into the market. So the question was, uh, where does mercury fit into uh, the model? Yeah, that would be coming out of the market and going into waste and... Um, waste going into Waste going into the fish stock. Okay. But coming out of market into a waste and then going to the fish stock. Since you're dealing with wild caught salmon, how many of the other ecological factors uh, are taken into account that would affect those populations that aren't included in the market? So, like their food or their predators. How is that being accounted for? So the question was, what other ecological factors are being considered um, within the system um, outside of just this uh, black box market? Uh, can, uh, can you like expand the question a little bit? Yeah, so I mean, you got perfect in depth, but do those take into account things like uh, increase in the number of predators of these fish, or do they take into account um, if their food supply is going to be due to other? Right, right. So to add to the question, uh, uh, the question is that uh, are there other concepts of number of predators that have been released or the pollutants or, or all the other factors that are I think uh, in the end uh, that was kind of related to black boxing is that waste uh, relates to let's say the pollutants in the water and the fish stock itself existing within that ecological boundary uh, the manifestation of that is the birth and death rates. So uh, we kind of like include that within the subsystem, but haven't like specified each and everything that affects the food. That, does that answer something? Yeah, there's sort of like externalities outside of the system a little bit. They're easy to look So they did all the work at Columbia River. There were people like sports fishermen wouldn't necessarily be in that system, but they're part of the ecology at some level as were Indians that had certain rights that wouldn't be in the market per se, that are, if you just depends where you set your boundaries, it gets a little more. Yeah. Okay, I think we now have a 10 minute break. Yeah. Uh, so we're zooming in 10 minutes. Yeah, so feel free to grab some snacks or suppliers and ask the speakers any questions you might have. Right. I guess the only other possibility would be uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't know how long it takes to clear the memory card to clear the memory card. I mean, but it's for Mr. B. And we can cut it with a stopwatch. Okay. I will be able to differentiate between these two. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and then you can still put the slides over that, or is it not necessary? You can see that. It's actually pretty good. So maybe it's not even worth it. Do you want to do it anyway, just in case? I'm going to always jump it and put it the quality of this is <laughs> too good. Oh, yeah. The sound quality yeah. is that we yeah. don't just like yeah. it yeah. on the fact that you can actually see speakers yeah. as much as like on the radio. But I, it's something I thought about a lot. So I'm totally yeah. open. It would be really nice to find that in the spring. I do like that before. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, we have to
watch the live stream and ask questions. And we have to never have some Maybe like once But that is It's a lot of work. I don't have the equipment. We should definitely use it. So if this is better quality and we can make a point to get it posted by midnight that night, like we're gonna notice a difference. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, I know like, I talked about the video before. That's true. And it is nice that, yeah, I do like the live stream. But yeah. But Ari, your text, I be talking. <laughs> I really like that line. It's very refreshing. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> It has the blog set on. Are you fully in that? Or is it kind of yeah. Cool. Yeah. Do you guys send out um, how little I know about the blog? Do you guys send out like a small Delicious foods, and I emailed my lab and one other lab and told them 
So theoretically, there should be like 15 to 20 people tops know about this. And in less than 24 hours, I went there with my like salad to have like meat, and cheese, and all that stuff. And it's cleared out. There was like half a cup of salad. And that was it. And like half a taquito. Oh, no, I did not drink that one. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Sick joke. Hey Chris, am I getting a column? I don't know. For the blog. Oh, that's sorry. Yeah. Very cool. So you guys like selecting just like people or was there like an application?
he cannot control his input beyond a certain extent. If there is uh, amount, some amount of mercury in the fish, then no amount of regulation on the fisherman is going to make that mercury go down. So let's just put the face to these subsystem boxes that we've been looking at till now because uh, it's important to dimensionalize this in terms of multifaceted human beings and not just like two dimensional boxes. Um, the, the, the person on the right, who's a farmer, uh, is there are multiple complexities that exist in terms of agriculture too, but there is no cap on the profit for the farmer, and the farmer is also able to earn a premium on the kind of produce that uh, he can bring to the market, as opposed to the fisherman who, because of quotas and regulations, actually has a cap on the profit at this point of time because of the regulations. So that brings us to the concept of the last step of comparing the standards between fisheries and agriculture, and that is uh, the organic standards were created within a decade or uh, a decade and a half of the demand uh, created in the market for those standards. And USDA, USDA was able to bring them to the market and uh, they were enforced. But in terms of fishing standards, uh, nothing exists till now in terms of standard on standards, and there was a question asked earlier too. And that is because there are multiple advocates and there are multiple stakeholders, and they're not even in the industry of fishing. And so it's it's very, very fundamental uh, to go down to the root of this and understand that there's a tragedy of the commons and not just between the fishermen, but between the fishermen, the industry who want to uh, just have more profit or optimal profit, but are somehow polluting the seas, uh, even the consumer who's just visiting the beach on a sunny day. So, uh, what can we do about it? So, right now, bringing it to the context of our project, uh, Michael and I are working with uh, the Harvard Office of Sustainability and the Harvard University and services to uh, begin to unravel some of the mysteries of the fish and so that uh, the dining services in this case can make better decisions around the campus and the campus can be used as a living lab and hopefully uh, the research and the findings are scalable to more large scale buyers. And so uh, the project actually falls under uh, the five prong sustainability plan of uh, the Office of Sustainability, uh, that's campus operations to better source seafood, uh, uh, taking care of the nature and the ecosystem where the food comes from, the health and well-being of the students, and uh, fostering an environment uh, for understanding culture and learning around some of these food systems. So, coming to why after looking at all these uh, systems diagrams, supply chain standards, coming back to our definition because we declared that we are going to be using that as a benchmark, why is eating sustainably important? So every decision you take as a consumer, and uh, a consumer actually belongs to that black box of the market, which we are going to expand upon, Every little tune up that happens to that box has an effect. It has an effect on what the supermarket stock, it has an effect on the perception of the product, it has an effect on ecosystems livelihood, and it has an effect on whether a fisherman not 100 miles from here is whether or not he's, he or she is able to buy Christmas presents for uh, his or her family. So, um, even though the standards are jarring, it is still our responsibilities, uh, responsibility to work on two levels. So uh, the short term is to take an effort to actually understand where these decisions are coming from and I think this talk has been a step towards that. And uh, supporting fisheries and fishing economy and not just uh, uh, be uh, be jarred by the complexity of the standards, but actually going ahead and making informed decisions in spite of the standards at this point. But also on the second level, advocating and uh, being uh, 
they're very cautious about better standards that are needed. And that doesn't mean that we just go for one size fits all standards and say that all fishes should be regulated in such and such way. But there is a lot of scope for having better standards. And if we as consumers vote for um, in terms of buying the right products or even having voices in public forums, then we can get more readable standards. So, so um, that began to tackle protein source on the plate. Um, and again, we're going to continue this analysis for what Harvard can and should be purchasing for their students. So the question, the next question is the next part of that plate, the greens. Could you begin to use seaweed and source seaweed in aquaculturally sourced produce as a means um, to feeding a growing population? So this is something that we do want to begin to complement this first analysis of aqua source um, protein. Um, and within the last 10 years, there has been more attention in research, um, and it's still being um, developed currently on the benefits um, of seaweed. And so seaweed, it, seaweed itself is um, full of vitamins and minerals, um, specifically from water, it's good for heart health, um, it can be used as a salt replacement, um, and seaweed can be grown without um, the use of fresh water, it's not grown on land, it's grown um, without fertilizer, and it naturally regenerates. So it does pr um, provide a new frontier for sourcing uh, food. And it can be harvested year round, so it can begin to complement the seasonality of local produce um, too. And so um, we do have uh, seaweed snacks for you guys to take away. Um, that is our live demo, and we have a short media segment that talks about the contemporary state of um, the current government trying to understand how do you regulate these things because. Um, in terms of uh, just beginning to grow these things, you have the same uh, systemic problems that come up in terms of pollution and things like that um, as you begin growing them. So, uh, we'll have this video really quickly, take questions, and then you guys can have seaweed snacks and talk to them. Seaweed cultivation in the U.S. is growing quickly. It promises to be a sustainable, low-impact form of aquaculture that could help feed billions and preserve the oceans. But tough state rules surrounding commercial use of coastal resources are preventing many would-be entrepreneurs from diving into the market. Dr. Charles Young, she is an internationally recognized seaweed expert and a marine sciences professor at the University of Connecticut in Stanford. He says 15 crops currently have permits in commercially grown kelp in the Northeast, up from zero prior to 2008. But most would be kelp farmers on the West Coast are in limbo as states work to establish regulations. So far, only Washington has regulations in place and just one research project underway. The Irish told NBC News the permitting process is very onerous. The approval process is delivered because regulators are determined to avoid environmental damage, including excessive nutrient discharge escapes of farmed animals and spread of disease inflicted by some big aquaculture operations of decades past. Stewardship Council is actually currently working on developing standards to begin to allow for aquaculture to grow as an industry. But we think currently Harvard does not source any aqua source produce, so we do think that's an opportunity for them too. And so we'd like to thank you guys. Thank you guys for spending um, your evenings with us. We'd like to thank Science and the News for hosting us. Um, support from Harvard, Harvard Office of Sustainability, um, the grant to continue the research, and uh, faculty from the Master Design Engineering Program. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 